I am honored to address you today. This is one of the biggest days of your collective lives. And yeah, I know you're in a hurry to walk across the stage, shake the president's hand, and get to your celebratory lunches with families and friends. I get it. So here's the deal. You give me 10 minutes, and I'll give you my two cents. You graduates from the Wall College probably realize that that's not the best exchange rate. <laughs> but I will provide you, uh, hopefully, with some things to ponder in the coming years while you chase your dreams. This message is for you, the college graduates. It's not for mom and dad. It's not for President DiCenzo or Provost Byington. And it's not for the Board of Trustees. This is for you, the CCU class of 2014. So I graduated from college precisely, uh, precisely 25 years ago in 1989, a quarter century ago, before most of you were born. <sighs> this just became a really depressing moment. Uh, 1989 was the end of a decade of big hair and acid wash jeans and members only jackets. MTV actually showed music videos back then. It was the year the Berlin Wall came down. The massacres in Tiananmen Square and Beijing were broadcast into our living rooms. And the Exxon Valdez spewed 240,000 barrels of crude oil into Alaska's Prince William Sound and one of the most devastating ecological disasters in history. There was a lot going on that year. Ask your parents sometime. Rain Man with Tom Cruise and Dustin Hoffman won the Oscar for Best Picture. But there was another film that year starring Robin Williams called The Dead Poets Society. I would guess that few of you graduates have ever heard of that movie, but I also imagine that almost everyone on this stage remembers it well. The film was about an inspiring and controversial teacher in New England, Vermont specifically, who pushed his students to think critically, to embrace life, and to question standards. One of the enduring quotations from that film was a Latin phrase by the Roman poet Horace. In Horace's odes written in 23 BCE, he advised his readers, carpe diem. Graduates, please repeat after me, carpe diem. Nicely done. It means seize the day. If I were giving this talk 25 years ago, it would have been a cliche to preach carpe diem to you from this particular pulpit. Everyone would have gotten the reference. Everyone would have seen the film twice. And perhaps it's still a cliche today, but not to most of you folks. Here's an interesting question. If something is a cliche, but no one knows it's a cliche, is it still a cliche? I'm banking on no at this point. Carpe diem, 2014 uh, graduates. What Horace and later Robin Williams was talking about was making things happen. Don't wait for your future passively. Go get it. Seize the day. Seize your lives. Take responsibility for your actions. Seize life's opportunities and challenges and, and make them your own. But as much as you enjoy your successes, relish your mistakes too. We frequently learn more from our failures than from our triumphs, and Thomas Edison has some wonderful things to say about the, the value of failure. Look them up sometime on your smartphones. And be ready, because life doesn't unfold the way you think it will. That would be boring. So 25 years ago, I stood on the football field after my graduation from a small liberal arts college in Minnesota. I gazed into my beautiful girlfriend's green eyes and said, baby, I don't know exactly what I want to do with my life, but I know two things for certain. One of them is, I don't want to go to graduate school. The second thing I know for certain is I don't want to be a teacher. Now here I am in front of you with a PhD a professor of Italian Renaissance art history and the chair of visual arts. This, my friends, is known as irony. <laughs> so much for things I knew for certain. Funny thing is, I didn't major in art history in college. I was a double major in English lit and, and uh, art studio. Heck, I didn't even minor in art history. The concept of devoting my professional 
and academic career to the esoteric history of art and architecture was not even a dim blip on my radar. So where and how and when and why did things change? Where, as Steve Martin might ask, did I find my special purpose? The fall after I graduated undergrad in 1989, I began teaching English and coaching the varsity soccer team at my old high school. I graduated from the American International School in Israel, just outside of Tel Aviv in a town called Kafarsh Mariahu. Don't worry, you won't have to pronounce that. Um, and it was within walking distance of the Mediterranean. My father was a US diplomat with the State Department, an unrepentant optimist, you might say. So my family moved around the globe a good bit, and my high school years were spent in what is arguably the most beautiful and contentious slice of the Middle Eastern pie. Now, fresh out of college, it was to be a fun year in a familiar place, near the sun-soaked beaches while I figured out what I wanted to do with my life. So, four weeks into the semester, the art teacher's water broke, which means, for those of you who aren't already conversant in these things, that she was going to have a baby and she couldn't work anymore. So the superintendent of the school charged into my office with a huge book and dropped it on my desk with a whoomp and said something like, here you go, kid. Don't screw this up. I was now apparently teaching advanced placement art history to high school seniors. The ancient stuff ziggurats and pyramids and parthenons and pantheons. I hadn't even taken that course in college. I was terrified, petrified, mortified. I spent every night for the rest of the semester reading feverishly, taking notes, organizing slides, quizzing myself, and barely staying one ahead of the AP students. I was exhausted, but I loved it. So one might conclude that upon reaching this transcendent epiphany, that I assiduously sought out a suitable graduate program with a euphoric passion for art history that bordered on obsession, and that I have rejoiced and regaled in unbridled paroxysms of academic and intellectual bliss ever since. Right? Not exactly. You see, I was first tempted by the dark side of the force. <sighs> After returning to the States, I fell rather unexpectedly into a very high-paying job designing marketing plans for General Mills in Minneapolis. You know, Wheaties and Michael Jordan and Cheerios and Lucky Charms and Betty Crocker and all that. I was 24 years old with World Series tickets, lots of money, a newish car, a cool apartment, the works. But did I really want to be that guy on his deathbed saying, I could have sold more Cocoa Puffs. <laughs> nope, I didn't. After two years, I quit the job, got married, and my new bride and I moved to Rwanda in Central Africa. And in case you're wondering, my wife of 22 years, Rebecca, who's sitting right up there, is the same girl I was with on that football field after graduation in 1989. A year later, I began my PhD program. Lots of twists, lots of turns, but each new adventure was a crucial learning experience. In many cases, learning what you don't want to do is a vital part of discovering what you do want to do. Think about that. So what does any of this have to do with you? I guess my thoughts are these. You're very different from who you were when you started here four or five or six <laughs> years ago. And you'll be very different five years from now and 10 years from now and so on. What you think you know for certain now is not what you will know in five years time. I do not intend to lecture you with protracted epistemological rhetoric here and I don't wanna get myself in trouble with my colleagues in philosophy. But let's just agree that of those few things that you might truly know, if you acknowledge that we ever know anything, your future is not among them, not even close. 
Indeed, you might say that the only thing you really know for certain is that you do not know your future. One is reminded of this Socratic paradox, I know that I know nothing. The phrase derives from Plato's discussion of Socrates, and it is perhaps the answer Socrates received some 2,400 years ago from the oracle at Delphi, but that's a whole other Oprah. Or is it? Look, graduating from college is very different from graduating high school. High school graduates think they know everything. College graduates, graduates realize they know almost nothing. And it's a little frightening, but don't panic. This is a good thing. The realization that your accumulated body of knowledge is but a drop in a cosmic bucket is the beginning of true wisdom. This is true. NASA and researchers worldwide agree that almost all of the billions of stars in our galaxy, not the universe, mind you, just our little galaxy, that almost all of them have at least one planet circling around it. Do the math. Revel in the excruciating profundity of your ignorance. I do. <laughs> you earned a great education at Coastal Carolina University from some of the best professors anywhere in the nation, many of whom joined me on the stage today. But your professors did not prepare you for one specific job. Nope. They prepared you for life, and its challenges and opportunities and heartaches. They taught you how to think globally, not myopically. They taught you how to think critically, not just how to remember dates or formulae. They taught you how to win with grace and fail with empathy. They helped you to think creatively, sympathetically, ethically. They taught you to be flexible and independent and resourceful. They prepared you for what you think you want to do now, but also for what you might discover that you want to do five years from now. They taught you to have opinions, but not to be opinionated. They helped you to be conscientious world citizens. They taught you to seize the day. Now, most of you switched majors at least once. Many of you switched majors several times. Yes, you did. I answered my share of the phone calls from your worried parents. Life is similar. You may switch jobs or careers several times, or you may find your dream job immediately. But however life plays out, be ready. Keep your eyes open. Go find it. Don't be afraid of change. Embrace it. And today, right now, the training wheels come off. Today, we send you down the street on your own knowing you might run into a mailbox and skim your knee or scrape an elbow. But you'll get back on the bike and do it again and again and again. And before long, you'll be riding that two-wheeler better than you ever thought possible. Your parents, your grandparents, and your friends will be watching you from the porch saying, that's my girl or that's my boy. And along the way, with the breeze blowing back your hair and the sun in your eyes and maybe the occasional bug in your teeth, you'll realize that it's not all about getting somewhere. It's about the thrill of the ride. It's about making the world a better place, not just making a buck. Maybe it's about turning off your smartphones once in a while and engaging with your physical world as well. It's about doing something you really enjoy and doing it really, really well. I am proud to have played a role in helping some of you prepare for the rest of your lives. On behalf of the Coastal Carolina University faculty, your Coastal Carolina University faculty, thank you for sharing four or five or six years of your lives with us. Carpe diem, 2014 graduates, seize the day. Thank you.